Hey, this is Brian Watt with KQED. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language and content that may not be suitable for all listeners. Discretion is advised. Okay, this is going to be fun. Being straight is like an anomaly in here. You know, I like to skip sometimes because you don't skip on a men's prison. I'm sure not. Ever. (laughs) Ever. Ever. Yeah. His way of flirting was, you know, maybe I'll stop by your cell and uh, show you the rest of my tattoos sometime, you know? I'm Nigel Poor. I'm Erlon Woods, and this is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. This is Pride Month, so we're doing something that's new for us pulling together stories we've told on Ear Hustle over the years about the LGBTQ community inside prison. We're going to start with one of my favorite Ear Hustle episodes, a San Quentin love story. It's called Boots and Max. So in 2019, this guy came to San Quentin, and he and I hit it off immediately. The connection was so good, I I literally remember the day. He walked me back to West Block, and you know, he showed me a couple of his tattoos. And his way of flirting was, you know, maybe I'll stop by your cell and I'll show you the rest of my tattoos sometime, you know. And I laughed. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, you know. And t- and I took a few more steps, and then I said, wait, are you fucking serious? Right? Because I thought he was joking. What, me? you got to be kidding me, right? I couldn't believe that someone as amazing as him would take an interest in me like Max is a nine and I'm like a two and like he chased me not the other way around you know he's got a beautiful smile and he's got this intelligent sense of humor like smart sense of humor and he's got this like rich voice you know it's just like it's nice to listen to like there's like all this stuff about him that's just very very attractive right since this is audio Will you, since you've described him in depth, will you describe yourself in depth? I'm short, fat, and ugly. Three easy words to just take, take very good care of that description right off the bat. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got these tiny little ears that look like chicharronis, like little pork skins. I got a question for you now. Yes? How does his ears look like chicharrones? Okay, well, it was funny that he used that word because um, I think you know I really love chicharrones, right? Whenever we go on a okay. road trip, that's right. my snack. Right. I recognize those ears. They're like just little curly, small, kind of like a shrimp. So Max and Boots started dating, and it's a little hard for me to imagine because, honestly, I don't know if I can think of a less romantic place in the world than a prison. What? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no privacy. Where do you go on dates? Well, I mean, you got to look at it probably through the eyes of the individuals that's falling in love, you know? It, it probably looks like a Venice or something. <laughs> right, so what you're saying is when you're in love, everything looks beautiful? Probably looks totally different. I mean, we'd sit on the lower yard watching the, 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 the baseball games. It was late summer, you know, uh, sun's going down by Mount Tam. And, I mean, come on, this is, this is shit that people do on the streets, right? You know? You go watch a, a, a baseball game in the late evening and, and just watch the fucking sun go down. That's crazy. It's like, it's normal shit. Honestly, I felt like I wasn't in prison. He took me out of this place. But unfortunately, being openly gay in prison isn't a romance novel. It can actually be pretty complicated and even risky. There are definitely a lot of guys in prison who aren't okay with Mm -hmm. with people being gay. And to be honest, I don't think this happens a lot. But sometimes, I mean, there can be violence. Yeah, I mean, I gotta say... The prisons I've been to are some of the most homophobic places I've ever been. Mm. And for Max, it got really bad. Boots said the problem started when Max moved into a new housing unit. H unit. Dorm living. It is totally different than living in a cell. It's completely open. There's so many people. No privacy. Um, You're really exposed. Immediately, the stresses, the the problems, the harassment. He's the only... um, the only gay guy in the, in the building he was in. 
he's not a weak guy. He's a he's a Marine Corps vet, and he's not flamboyant either. Not a person who bothers people, gets in their way. He's not a rat, not any of that stuff. Got along very well with everyone, but one guy. It was about ten minutes after eight o'clock at night, and this guy on my tier came to my bars and said, "Hey, I don't know what has happened, but they just took Max off the yard." on the back of a cart, and he was covered in blood. I, I don't know, my mind just, I was just blank. I just, I jumped up, I grabbed my ID, and I ran. A couple of guys on the yard were like, yeah, they, they took Max, they took Max. They were saying his, uh, his blood was on the ground back there. I was fucking furious, you know? I've spent a lot of my life in these places. I had no idea except to try to level that playing field in some kind of way, you know? Just like I'm sure 90% of everyone else in this place, you know, when somebody hurts you, 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 you hurt back. Every chance I got, I was going out of the yard trying to find the guy and trying to find out who he was and just being, honestly, being an idiot. And finally, this guy that knew a guy was pointing him out to me that's him right there and as he's telling me there's one cop coming from this direction two cops coming from another direction and they were escorting him off the yard I don't have a history of being loved and appreciated and cared for and, and so having that and then losing it and having no information on how he was doing and, and whether he was okay, and I, did, I had no idea how to deal with that. I identify as a fag most of the time, but yes, I'm gay. Why do you choose that word? Um, well... Is it okay to just speak freely like yes, normally? Please. Okay, it's basically it's a fuck you to all the guys that hate faggots and queers and punks and and everything else. Prison is probably twenty or twenty five years behind the times, and there's a lot of prejudice and there's a lot of bullshit. And so like calling myself a fag is like getting to the punchline before everybody else does. It takes the power back a little bit. I'm just wondering, like, uh, we always hear this thing, like, we can take the power back from words by just calling ourselves that. And I wonder if that's what's really happening. Or do we just, like, is that just our coping mechanism? Well, it probably is part that. It's maybe a mixture of both. I don't think everything is, is as clear-cut psychologically as, as just one one thing. But hearing the words on the tear like I do... Even in here, where I work at, I hear it. I hear it all day, every day. And my way is to just be like, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna own it, you know? I'm a fag, if you don't like it, you know? That's your problem, that's not mine. I wanna point out the way you said the word faggot. You said it in a very different way, which was with gusto mm. and some kind of, I would say almost relish. When you said it to me the first time, I was like, oh. He really loves that word. I think maybe it might help to understand, too, where I came from. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually come out of the closet until my 30s. I had experiences, but I didn't own it. I've hmm. hated gay people. I have attacked men for acting in a way that I perceived as being feminine. Now that I've not only come out, but also overcome a lot of the prejudice and the stereotypes and the being in prison and being uh, one of the most hated demographics, or if not hated, then at least um, stereotyped. You know, when I call myself a fag, I'm a big old fag, you know? I own that shit. It's mm -hmm. mine, you mm -hmm. know? And that's kind of the way I see it. Yeah. You know, I'm a man who loves men. What? What's, what's the big deal, you know? Yeah. Max was in the hospital for 23 days, and Boots was just waiting for news about how he was doing. He had to have spinal fusion surgery, had to have his jaw put back together because the entire bottom half was split. The hinge of his jaw was shattered. His nose was broken. His eye socket was shattered. 
He was in between uh, Marin General Hospital and the hospital here for 23 days. Eventually, Max was brought back to the hospital at San Quentin. But it wasn't like Boots could visit him there. Nope. I used to go out to the yard at night and hold up these signs to him, you know, to his window. He's on the fourth floor. I knew what, 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 what room he was in. What would they I, say? Yeah, well, said, I woof you. <laughs> he says what? I made these signs on, on, on poster board taped together, you know, and I held them up. I said, you know, come back, come back, come back. I actually made a shirt one time, uh, took a white T-shirt and put a big old paw print on it. That's like adorable and it's so wonderful but like prison is not a place where you think of people showing you know that kind of fun loving exuberant I don't care I just love this person kind of spectacle I gotta ask New Yorker question what does it feel like hearing about someone experiencing this kind of love in prison I'm jealous because I don't have the same opportunity do you think that drives some of the homophobia I don't know, but I'm definitely jealous. I'm definitely hating now. <laughs> yeah, New York, that's got to be hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, Erlon, I was really struck by New York's reaction. That kind of jealousy never occurred to me before. Well, I mean, you know, prison can be really lonely. I mean, there's a lot of feelings that you put on hold, you know, while you're in there. Yeah, I bet. Finally, after 23 days, Max was released from the hospital. Boots said he first caught sight of him as Max was being escorted down the tier by guards. Max is one of those, uh, okay, so he's Mexican, right? With this, this very thick, like, luxurious beard, right? Um, but when he first came back from the hospital, he hardly had any beard at all because, you know, he had to have the surgeries and all this stuff. So most of it was gone. And so at first he didn't even look the same. Couldn't even hug him. I couldn't even like hold on to him. I couldn't. I couldn't do nothing. And what I wanted to do was just like snatch him up and and fucking protect him and drag him in the cell and just just kiss him and like make everything be better. I couldn't do none of that. Could you touch each other through the? So through the bars, holding hands through the bars. And my cellie's behind me. My cellie's straight, kind of conservative, Filipino, lifer. Really good dude, but conservative. So I'm trying to keep the conversation a little bit clean and not make him uncomfortable, but at the same time, like, I'm, like, chomping at the bit. But, like, were you putting, like, your fingers through Yes, the... absolutely. We're holding hands through the bars and trying to, you know, block that with, with my, you know, with, with my body, you know. Man, my heart was, like, just going crazy. I was all smiles, and finally... You know, I didn't even care. I kissed him through the bars. And then my celly behind me, I heard my celly behind me, like, oh, my fucking God, you know? <laughs> and after all that trauma and everything they went through, the months that followed, I mean, they actually got to live together, just like a couple on the outside. So how long did you have together after he got out of the... So we only had another eight months, I think, after he came back. Okay, and those were great eight months? Oh, that was amazing. The celly that I had moved to North Block, um, and Max moved in my cell. The guys just tell him, this is, this is crazy, I can't believe you're, you're actually here. It's amazing, you know, that I had to come to prison to meet somebody I've never had an argument with. I've got this tattoo right here on my, on my wrist. It's a little paw print, it says woof. Um, He's got, he's got one, too. We've got the same, <laughs> the same matching tattoos. Oh. Um, I love him. He's the first person in my life that ever loved me back, you know? So what happened to Max, ultimately? So Max paroled. He paroled uh, June 10th, right before the coronavirus outbreak 2020. Um, and he's doing very well. He's working for Warner Brothers now uh, as a camera operator, and uh, we'll be working the Super Bowl this year. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm so proud of him. He's doing real, real good. And so now that he's gone, do you, do you find yourself living in that memory? All the time. Every day. Every single day. I've got a little, uh, I've got a little notebook, actually. You know, like I write little notes to him all the time, and 
Um, it's got the little teal leather cover on it, and um, as soon as I get it all filled up, I'll send it to him. You know, mm. there's a physical place of safety and happiness and just well-being. You know, when you love somebody and when they love you back, and it's okay to be a fucking man and still be a little bit vulnerable. You're not supposed to get that in prison, but we did. We'll be right back with more stories from Ear Hustle's Pride Month special. This next piece comes from one of our Catch a Kite episodes from a couple of seasons back. You remember that one, Nigel? Hmm. The one where we got incarcerated men and women to trade kites with each other? Yes. So they finally got the opportunity to like satisfy their curiosity about what life is like in, in those other prisons. Right. Places where they can't normally go. My name is John Levin, and I've been incarcerated for 13 years. One of the questions I have would be, do they think about men as often as we think about women? <laughs> that, was, that was one question I had. We gave that one to an incarcerated woman named Rakesha Scott. No. I don't believe that's true. <laughs> Being straight is like an anomaly in here. It's weird, you know? Mm-hmm. So a lot of women in here, they don't think about men because they're not into men. Uh, most of them have been hurt by a man they don't want to deal with men. So I don't think that they um, think about men half as much as you guys think about women. My first thought was not in your wildest dreams. (laughs) And here's Alice Copeland. Many of these gals in here have husbands and they have boyfriends and they have significant others on the outside. But when it comes to sex, They partner up real quick in here. Some of them eventually become roommates and end up with uh, interesting romances. But they still have the husbands, and they still have the boyfriends, and they still have the significant others. And I watched it happen over and over and over. The guys said, well, crap, she's gone for the duration, so that's the end of that shit. They changed their phone numbers, and they're gone, and they come unglued. They're angry as all hell, and they don't want anything to do with men for a long time after that. So, again, they look for companionship where they can get it. Or you got the women in here that, hey, you know, they let their fingers do the walking. You know, they take care of themselves. We can't speak for all women's prisons, but at least at the one where we spent time, gay relationships were, I mean, just out in the open. open, No big deal. You know, just like Rakesha and Alice were saying. And in men's prison, like we heard in Boots and Max's story, eh, not so much. Succinctly, who is Mike Adams? A gentle, sensitive, God-fearing man who has struggles and challenges like everybody else and just wants to be loved and to love. Sing about it. I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days and some lonely nights. But when I, when I look around and I think things over. This is Mike Adams. He's currently incarcerated at San Quentin State Prison. I think there's a lot of uh, homophobia in prison. Uh, the environment in itself is based on hypermasculinity, you know, kind of the alpha male. And so homosexuality or any LGBT issues... 
actually undermine the strength because heterosexual people see it as a weakness. And so where it's a kill or be killed or survival of the fittest mindset in prison, homosexuality is seen as a, a fault, as, as really a liability. And so for people who have seen that and maybe have experienced homosexuality or are homosexuals or lesbians or transgenders, to survive, they have to hide. And that's internalized fear. Mike's a part of a group called ACT, Acting with Compassion and Truth. They get together and talk about LGBTQ issues. And I'm hoping that my ability to identify in the way that I do with the LGBTQ community helps to bridge a gap of understanding about where people are. There's always a backstory. Some of what you're doing here is about the backstory. Right. And people don't want to hear the backstory, especially if it challenges their ideas about something. Back in 2018, when we talked to Mike, San Quentin had just screened a movie inside the prison that caused a huge stir. Recently, we saw the movie Moonlight, and the images were of a strong black man, right, muscular, got the do-rag on, the gold chains, right? And a lot of people were offended by that because that's not the image that society paints of homosexuals. And so it, it makes you uncomfortable when a place that you walk in as a black man, right, or any man for that matter, And all of a sudden, you can identify with the external that you see in this person, but internally, he's informed by something else. So there's this whole other dynamic of who am I and and what does that happen to be? So people, yeah, it's it's crazy to live it. Erlon, when Moonlight played at San Quentin, it was the most I ever heard guys yell down in the media lab. I mean, they were really offended by it. Yeah, last year, there was a screening of the movie up in the chapel, and I didn't go, but I heard a lot of people walked out. Erlon, you and I had this conversation back in 2018. And do you think that screening Moonlight now would be such a big deal? Mm, Not really. I mean, some people are definitely going to be like, ah, but then San Quentin is pretty much a different prison now. Do you think that just like on the outside, the attitudes are changing, it's the same inside? I mean, I I think it boils down to people just minding their own business. You know, staying out of other people's business. You know, it ain't your lifestyle. You ain't living it. Let it be. My born name was Kamisha Rich. I changed my name to Marcel Rabanis, which is my family last name. And Marcel is what my mother would have named her, named me if I would have been a boy. This comes from a story about a trans man named Marcel, who had just been released from a woman's prison after serving 23 years. I've been in a box from 15 to 41. Even though I lived my life as a boy, I still was a child. I'm learning how to be an adult free. Then I'm learning how to be an adult male, right? So that's two. And then I have a lot of negative male characteristics that I have. That's three. That's stuff that I've learned from growing up. Like my belief system was for a long time was like, I should have all the girls. I'm handsome. I I can get any, you know, I should have five girlfriends and everybody should know about it. Everybody should get along. I didn't know that I was um, womanizing women. You know, I learned that in prison or... Or I feel like I should be able to, you do what I tell you to do type of, you know, that control stuff that I had to work on. So I, I know that I have a lot of negative male characteristics. And so I'm changing them mm-hmm. and learning how, how that fits um, to socialize with positive men that are doing positive things so that I could be, I'm shaping myself to be the man that I want to be. How does it feel to be a man is uh, it's easy. It's an easy question. It just feels good to be able to be me. Now, what does being a man mean? That's a whole different question. While Marcel was in prison, he enrolled in a college program. 
I had two guy professors, white boys. And uh, they were married, and they both had kids and stuff. And I remember my one professor, he talked about his kids. And he, um, he said, I'm not going to be here on um, Halloween, you guys. I just want to let you guys know because you guys are my students, and I respect you and love you guys. He said, but um, I got to take my kids out. And I said, you got to take your kids out. He was like, yeah. He said, I have two children, and I'm their father. And I think that I'm supposed to be there with them to go trick-or-treating. And I said, well, why? He said, because it's not my wife's responsibility to raise my our children. It's our responsibility. And that's just not the kind of guy. And I laughed, and I said, that's the kind of guy I want to be. Eventually, Marcel became eligible to go before the parole board. Where he could make a case that he had done the work and was ready to get out of prison. And when Marcel went before the board... His identity as a trans man was part of the conversation. It was a very big topic in the boardroom about me being a transgender. I mean, he asked me questions about where are you going to go to the bathroom? Have you thought, like, all of this stuff? And I answered to the best that I could, and he said that he knew that this is who I was. i never forget it. When they tell you that you got found suitable, they read, like, this paper. I swear it's a page long. He moved the computer and he linked into me and he said, so what I'm saying to you is you can go home, Mr. Marcel Rabanis. And I looked at him, he said, and he, and he, um, he was like, and you're going to be a good man. We'll be right back after the break. This next bit comes from an Ear Hustle episode we did really early on in the show. Erlon, I think it was like season two. Yep, it was called Down Low, and it was all about the LGBTQ community at San Quentin State Prison. The one transgender woman that pretty much everybody in San Quentin knows is Jarvis Jovan. Lady J. Okay, my bad. I've been checked. (laughs) I'll go back to it, Lady J. Lady J has been in prison for almost 30 years and at San Quentin for about five. Yes, ma'am. Could you just describe yourself for me? Okay, this is going to be fun. So, I am five, ten and a half. I weigh none of your business. I'm very voluptuous. I have boobs a go-go. I have backside for days, big thighs, cute face, You know, I couldn't be more cute if I tried, if I drew my own self. Lady J has identified as female since childhood. She's 57 years old now and is from San Diego. So you came in as a woman. Very much so. I was 26, 27 when I came in, and uh, I lived on the street as a woman. Um, Even my court case even talks about how I used to walk around the apartment complex and do bikini contests with the uh, girls in the neighborhood. And the woman that got on the stand said, it was so disgusting. Mr. Clark would walk around in the bikini and the men would, yeah, because I was a bumping chick, don't hate, my body was on fleek. Or is it fleek? I would say fleek. Fleek, it was on fleek. I don't know what that means, but I know it meant my body was all that in a bag of chips. So why didn't you go to a woman's prison? Why were you put in a men's prison? Well, because I still have that nasty little peanut, peanut this, this, a, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, Audi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So because I still have this Audi, um, I'm not allowed to go to a women's prison because I haven't fully transitioned. And when I came to prison, there was no such thing as the state giving you a sex change. When I came to prison, it was you're classified as a male, you're going to a male's prison, no matter what form of LGBTQ you were. They went directly by what it says on your birth certificate. Period. Back when we spoke to Lady J, that's how it was. 
transgender women served their sentences in men's prisons. I'm going to do a little history lesson. Okay, so when I first came in, it was 1989. And the thing for men back then is, I, would, I don't want to say it was almost acceptable, but if you got with a transgender, it was almost like, okay, you're strong enough to handle it. And a lot of guys back then were doing it. It's okay to have a girl. As long as she was a girl, not a gay boy, but a girl. In the 1990s, Lady J was serving time in Calipatria, a maximum security prison east of San Diego. And during that time, she shared a cell with a man who was much more than a celly. His homeboys felt that it would be one hell of a lark to see a makeshift wedding. So I said, okay, I rode along with it. You know, he proposed. After he proposed, we decided on a date. And in prison, necessity is the mother of invention. So um, to make a wedding gown, I took a laundry bag, and at that time, the laundry bags were blue. Before you get there, the laundry <laughs> bag is see-through. The laundry bag oh, is Oh, the like, laundry bag, but you have oh, to... Oh, the mesh the, ones? The, oh, the, had, the mesh laundry oh, bags. Oh, great. Yes, it did. I was a lot smaller then, but still quite shapely. Picture that. It was cute. It was really, really cute. So I said, okay, I need a veil. So I took a white T-shirt, flipped it upside down, so the neck became like my waistline, and the bottom of the t-shirt became my veil. It was very chic. And um, my uh, Sally, wink, wink, he put on his best blues and his best man put on his best blues. We walked out and we had um, all of my homeboys from San Diego. They were sitting on one side, so they were the guest of the bride. His homeboys was on the other side. And uh, one of his younger homeboys became the officiator of the ceremony. So what were the vows? Do you, Lady J, take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband, to honor, to love, to cherish, in sickness and in health, share your canteen with him and your packages, Uh uh-huh, he's mine, I'm his, I'm his, he's mine. Uh, We jumped over a broom, so that was my wedding. A lot has changed since we spoke to Lady J. Yep, in 2021, a new law came into effect in California that allows transgender, non-binary, and intersex people to be housed in a prison that aligns with their gender identity. And just recently, we met two trans women who, thanks to the new law, were able to transfer to the California Institution for Women, a prison near Los Angeles. I was really surprised. I never dreamed that it could happen. This is Kier Anderson. But when I heard that not only was it possible, but that it was going to happen, I immediately filed my paperwork. I wanted to be the first one on the bus. Do you remember when you you started hearing that the laws were going to change and that you could come to a woman's prison if you wanted to? I was so pumped. I was so pumped. This is Cassidy Porter. Did you think it would ever happen? No. I thought it was just all smoke and mirrors. No, I was absolutely surprised when they finally passed it. I mean, I had the shock of this actually taking place and occurring it was so overwhelming for me that I just cried these tears of happiness. My cellmates thought I was too emotional, but yeah, I was excited. So can you tell us about the decision to leave a men's prison and come to a woman's prison? Wasn't a hard decision, huh? It was a hard decision. It was? It was, it was, there was quite a bit of thought put into it. I can go from one prison to another on the men's side and I know what's going to happen. I know what the dynamic is. I know what the yard feel is going to be. I can tell when things are going good and when things are going bad. I didn't know what that was going to be like. But once the decision was made, I was committed to it. I had two goals. One was to get my surgery. That was the primary goal, was to go through that part of it. And I knew I couldn't do that in place else, but here at a women's prison because I could not be like this at a men's prison. It's just far too dangerous. I really didn't know what to expect. What I was really looking forward to is being among women and having those role models, not being trapped 
in male prison culture, which is a hard, cold environment. Hi, my name is Michelle Cato, C-A-T-O. And what pronoun do you use? I consider myself a transgender. I identify with being male, but however, in my environment, I don't like to stress the pronouns. I just like to be called by my name. Michelle? Yes, or okay. Cato. Or Cato. Yes. Okay, which do you prefer? I prefer Cato, but okay. either or I'm okay with. But I prefer Cato because it's it has a more of a masculine feel. You know, I don't want to change what my mom put, so I go by my last name yeah. first. Cato is also incarcerated at the California Institution for Women, and he's, like, sort of compact, has these short dreads. What really made an impression on me was his face. You know, it was really open and sort of just invited conversation. You just said something that grabbed my attention, that you don't want to change the name your mom gave you. Yes. My name is my name, you know? Mm. And, you know, my mother gave me that name. So it's honorable. My name is Michelle Cato, and I prefer to be called Cato. But I'm still a sister. I still have siblings, you know. I'm still a daughter, but this is going to always be my mother, and I'm going to always be her daughter. I'm learning to mesh both of what I have to be who I am. I just want to be comfortable in my skin, you yeah. know, and unapologetic about it, you know. On paper... Under the new law, someone like Cato could transfer to a men's prison. Yes, but so far, not a single trans man has done that. Have you ever thought about transferring to a male prison? Absolutely not. I wouldn't put myself in harm's way. It don't take no genius to figure that out, whether I got a surgery or not. And I don't know of no female transgender from female to male that wants to really be in a male facility. Now, you hear people that, that do the talk, but I have yet to know one, you know. They say it would be okay, but I wouldn't put myself in no situation like that. You know, I'm born female. What do I look like going to a men's prison just because I'm, I, my arms is bigger or I have this? Whether you have the surgery or not, if a man knows that you were once a woman, then you, you're not safe, you know. That's what you always say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're not safe. Yeah. We've asked trans men, would they go to a men's prison? Oh, yeah. What's your thoughts there? I wouldn't personally. This is McCall, another trans man incarcerated at CIW. I I personally don't feel safe. And when I say that, it's due to my trauma as a child. I don't feel safe around men in there. You could be a target, right? you know, for being a trans man. So I don't want to experience that. So for now, McCall and all the other trans men we met at the California Institution for Women are staying put. But you know, Erlon, for McCall at least, prison has been a place where he's been able to kind of, I don't know, sort of find himself. So when I was out there, I felt like even though I was free and even though my, my family didn't agree with it, but they just let me be and they loved me no matter what. But and still, I felt myself trapped and people would be not accepting of me. They will say things underneath their breath or, you know, they'll look at me when I walk in a public restroom and be like, like, what are you doing here? Like, why are you in this room? restroom you don't belong here and look at me all scary like like if i'm a pedophile you know and it made me feel so degrading it's so are you are saying that in prison you had found freedom to be yourself yes isn't that outrageous yeah it is it, it's, it's still crazy it's yeah. crazy like i i tell this to my bunkie it's so crazy that I found freedom here. Like, a lot of people come here and they don't feel f- free. They cry about being in here. They cry. They hate it. I mean, I'm not saying that I love being in prison, but I one thing I, I, I like being in prison is that I can be myself. And nobody's going to judge me or discriminate me or tell me that they're not going to love me. 
you know? So it's me. I have my freedom. That's all I have. So for the trans women who are trying to move from the men's prison to the women's prison, they got to go through a pretty extensive process. Yes. It's not like you can just say, I want to transfer to a woman's prison and you're on the next bus out. There's this extensive vetting process and it can actually take years to do. But still, I think there's a real belief that some men would just lie and say they're trans so that they can come to a women's prison Mm -hmm. and, you know, have sex with women. Right. Or just because it's a nicer place to be. How do you feel about transgender women coming to a women's prison? A lot of people were scared. The ladies was thinking, oh, they're going to, you know, take it from us and all. There are a lot of women here that were abused by men, so they have that instant fear. It's awkward. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable, you know. You see some trans people that are here from men's prison that are legit, and you see some that are not. Um, I think we should unpack that a bit, Erlon. So I think what Cato is saying is that he thinks some of these trans women are just pretending to be trans. Under the new law, trans women do not need to be taking hormones, nor do they have to have had any gender-confirming surgery to apply to transfer to a woman's prison. They just have to identify as female. And that makes some people at the women's prison nervous. Has that caused tension? Yes, it it causes tension, you know? It causes a lot of tension. Like, you know, in the shower, we have somebody that's in our unit that's like that. And nobody likes to be in the shower with him, her. It's awkward. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable. People just rolling their eyes. You know, they don't want to be rude, but this is the type of feeling that you get because you can see that something that was put in place to help people that, that's under that umbrella, somebody has found a way to manipulate it, to use it to get here. So far, 50 trans women have been approved to transfer from men's prison in California to women's prisons. Here's Kieran Cassidy again. You know, we were very cautious. We didn't want to scare anybody. We didn't want anyone to be afraid of us. I was pretty sensitive to that. I'm, I, I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm not here to sexually exploit anybody. I wanted to be, you know, accessible, friendly. I didn't want to, to, to turn anybody off. There was a bit of trepidation in my coming here, plus the things that I had heard about this place, that we weren't wanted, that there was a lot of angst as far as our presence here. And I do get that on occasion. Uh, I'll have women tell me flat to my face that, you know, we don't want you here. The day we were transferred from the men's prison to the women's prison, I came with another inmate. It was early in the morning. It's a beautiful day. We were driving into the rising sun. It was pretty inspirational. Through the most beautiful parts of California, there were vineyards on both sides for miles. I felt pretty optimistic. This day has finally come. We came to the gate. I started seeing the female porters and said, we're really here. I can recall the very first moment I pulled up into the reception for women. I was in oranges, so I had to strip out, uh, and men, they just kind of throw things to the grate, you know, here's your shirt, here's your pants, shoes, da 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 Women, they brought it out in a nice little box. Here's my shoes, here's your socks, here's your underwear, here's your bra, here's your shirt, here's your pants. If these sizes don't fit you, just let us know, we'll get you some more to fit you. And I was kind of like, mm, really? <laughs> you would really do that? The greatest thing I've had is this decrease in stress that I experienced. That hyper-awareness that you have to have on a men's yard. You don't have to have that here. And that just makes your sleep better. Uh, I mean, I sleep through the night now. I really haven't experienced that until I came here. You know, I like to skip sometimes because you don't skip on a men's prison. I'm sure not. Ever. I'm sure not. Ever. Ever. Yeah. I don't have to walk the yard with a buddy. I'm really accustomed to doing that. 
I don't have to be aware of my surroundings or who's around me. I don't feel a threat anywhere around here. Even some of the big girls, I don't sense as being a threat. In fact, quite a few of them are my friends. I feel so blessed. I'm very grateful to be accepted and appreciated here. I have lots of friends. People are really nice to me. I just had a birthday earlier this week and I work in the sewing factory. Everybody's saying happy birthday to me and they sign my birthday card and so many people told me that they love me and that they're glad to have me here. And I just, I'm humbled and grateful to be a part of it and it has really helped me with my transition. Here, I'm among women and that really helps me with my gender expression because I need role models. Here's Simon. Oh, sorry. Now, can who are you? <laughs> I'm a former inmate. I went from an from an inmate to an employee in Revolution. Seven years since I started. Okay, this last bit of audio comes from an episode where our Ear Hustle team actually got to go on the road. Yep, we were in Norway, learning about what prison life is like over there. And one of the guys we met, a formerly incarcerated man named Simon, told us a story about a pretty remarkable thing that happened at a prison there. What's the t-shirt that you're wearing? So it just says pride in some small letters over there. Right, so it says pride in, in the colors, and it's on top of the, the radio. This one was made especially for our first in-prison pride parade anywhere in the world. True pioneering. We had it the 15th of October uh, last year. We declared the second Friday of October as International Prison Pride Day. And in Norway, we come uh, a long way. 50 years ago, uh, it stopped being against the law. Is there a lot of um, LGBT phobia in um, prisons in Norway? Prison is probably uh, one of the places where it's the hardest to be gay of or transsexual and it's a hyper masculine environment and for me uh, as, a, as a hugger you can't hug people because that's gay and the, first of all there's nothing wrong with being gay then uh, why can't you give people a hug we have inmates only because of their sexuality they have been beaten they have uh, been threatened, they have been told by staff that you shouldn't come out of your cell because people will beat you up. Yeah. We knew about one inmate, so we thought maybe one or two, and there were 13 inmates. 13 people doesn't sound like much, but when the first Pride Parade started in Oslo, it was also only like 20 people. My master stroke in here was that uh, there's a band in Oslo. They're a really big brass band. They're very cool. I booked them and there were like 17 musicians walking in the parade. There's 13 inmates and uh, of course some employees within their uniforms and yeah. There were people dancing? People were dancing. They had a concert afterwards where people in uniforms and the inmates were dancing together. So it was uh, Pe- People who worked there and people who were incarcerated were dancing together? Yeah. And nothing went wrong? Nothing went wrong. Why do you personally care? I mean, there's so many things you could work on to change in the prison. Why did you care to spearhead this? Uh, I had a, f- a friend who killed himself. He was a... Uh, very effeminate uh, gay guy. He was in prison and I'm sure that he got harassed because he just was his beautiful self. So uh, that's the personal, personal uh, thing. And um, yeah. Did you think a lot about him when you were working on this? uh, I dedicated my work to him, kind of. (laughs) Uh, So um, yeah, he was a very fun person uh, and it's always strange when people have so much life pass away so uh, I think about him sometimes and I hope yeah I don't, I'm not religious so I don't think he's uh, looking down from me from some uh, cloud but yeah I hope he got his peace That 
that was fun, Nige. Mm-hmm. I think we should do this again sometime. Definitely. And meanwhile, happy Pride, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nigel Poor. And I'm Merlon Woods. We'll be back with the first episode of Season 12 on September 6th. Woohoo! Radiotopia. From P.